Welcome to the show today, Brennan. It's so nice to meet you. Marsha, the pleasure is absolutely mine. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Can you tell everyone where you're from? Yeah, absolutely. I'm based in Montreal. My parents immigrated from a small country called Sri Lanka in the early 90s, but I was born and raised in Canada, thankfully for me. That's so amazing. Not too often do I actually get to have conversations with other Canadians. A lot of times, oh. yeah, I am I am in Ontario. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, we're not actually that far from each other. So I would love it if you would give just a, a brief intro on who you are, because when I was looking you up, there's all these different things that you do. And I want to dive into all parts of your story. Yeah, absolutely, Marsha. I, I would say, you know, who I am is I'm a communication coach. Right. So I started Master Talk, which is a YouTube channel to help people who can't afford a communication coach. And then outside of that, I have a coaching business for people who can. But but how that got started was funny, which which is when I went to university, I went to business school, I went to Concordia. You probably know it since I you do. live a few, you, few hours away from me. Yeah. So, so I went to business school there. And my goal is never to be an entrepreneur. And the, the goal was to get a great job as an executive, be very successful in the business world, but not as an entrepreneur. But then I started doing these things called case competitions. Think of it like professional sports for nerds. So while other guys my age are playing basketball or rugby, I was doing presentations competitively. And it's that experience that led to Master Talk because I felt that everything I was coaching the students on wasn't available for free on the internet. No, absolutely. And so did you start to create Master Talk? Like did like did you go into a traditional job and then create Master Talk or did you go right into Master Talk? That's correct. I actually did have a traditional job. So what happened was when I was 12, let's start at 12, actually. You know, at 12 years old, you have that that yearbook that you do after elementary school. <laughs> yep. Right. So every average 12 year old, the smart ones anyways, they'll say, you know, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a stand community. They'll actually aspire to be something amazing. You know what I wrote in my yearbook, Marsha? I wrote accountant. Right. Mm -hmm. And I never changed my mind mm -hmm. and until very recently. And the reason is because a lot of us, you know, we dream about the bigger thing we want out of life. And I do that now, you know, with with my dreams and, and where I'm working at now. But when I was much younger. I didn't have a lot of money. You know, my parents were factory workers. Mm -hmm. And so my goal was to get a great job in accounting. So I went to that and then I transitioned to a technology consulting role at IBM. And I side hustled Master Talk for three years. And I quit IBM to, to do this full time, probably a year and a half ago. Oh, so you, it's only been in the last year and a half that you. Wow. Good for you. Correct. But I've been coaching for seven years, mm -hmm. which is interesting too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which tell, is kind of <laughs> tell us about that. You said coaching for seven years. So coaching one-on-one -on -one or group, or what did that look like? Oh no, there's no, there's no specifics here. It was actually an accident. So, so let me draw the context a little bit. Once again, the goal is never to be a coach, Marsha, right? I didn't even know you can get paid to do this. Mm -hmm. So, so when I was 19, that's when I started I started winning these case competitions. It's kind of like sports drafting, but for business jobs versus getting into a professional sports league. That's okay. what these case competitions are. You put a suit on, you're 20 years old, you're giving these business presentations to vice presidents at Walmart, and they go, I like this kid, let's give him a job. That's basically how these things work. <laughs> so I started doing really well at these competitions. I, I call myself the Michael Jordan that nobody gives a shit about in the <laughs> sense of Mike was really serious about basketball. Yeah. Well, people care about basketball and you can get scrutinized for being an ass, but mm -hmm. not in not in my field. I was the same way. It's just nobody cared because it's presentation. <laughs> so what happened is I got I became the dictator of that program, essentially. That's the right way of putting it when I was 20. And then I started coaching the other people who were starting to enter the pro because I wanted them to win competitions. But I didn't know how to coach. I was just helping them. And that's how I figured it out through trial and error. Oh, I love that. I love how it it's it's always it only is when we look back and we're like, oh, that actually makes sense now. I didn't realize it at the time. It made no sense when I was doing right. it. So when you talk about um communication coach, what do you think? And then this is just in it's it's a combination of what you learned through school, through your case presentations, and through master talks. What do you think is the top one or two things people are missing when it comes to being able to communicate? Absolutely, Marcia. I would say the first step is dreaming. I know that sounds a little bit weird, so hear me out. A lot of us dream about the expensive vacations we want to go on. Mm -hmm. The things we want to do with our family, the expensive things we want to buy. When was the last time we dreamed about our communication skills? And the answer for most of us, right, it's is never. Probably never. 
whatever. Yeah. So, so the question I always start with, because communication is surrounded by so much anxiety, fear, and stress. Mm -hmm. My question is, how would your life change if you were an exceptional communicator? And I have people reflect on that question. So everyone listening to this right now, just ask yourself, how would impact your life? Because what this question does, Marsha, is it changes our energy around communication. Mm -hmm. We start to get motivated, which I believe is the biggest challenge in comms, is getting motivated to even do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So dreaming is that first piece of it. And you, you, I think you hit it right there on the head is the fact that we have so much anxiety, um, fear about speaking. And why do you think that is? Great question. If you had asked me that three years ago, I probably wouldn't have a good answer for you, but thankfully you caught me in the, in the right time period of history. Again. <laughs> so, so the answer is, it makes sense if you think about it. Where do we learn how to speak, Marsha? We learn how to speak in school. Mm -hmm. right? That's where we give all the presentations. Mm -hmm. Elementary school, high school. But there's three fundamental problems with all of those presentations. Number one is that they're all mandatory. We don't wake up one morning and say, hey, Marsha, you want to get breakfast in Ontario and present all day? Nobody says that. No. Right. So that's number one. Yeah. Number two, all of those presentations are different. So it's never, hey, Marsha, what are you passionate about? Hey, Brennan, what are you passionate about? Do you love books? Do you like the color blue? Like, what do you want to give a presentation on? Or podcasting? No, you got to talk about Shakespearean poetry. And then after you've done that, you got to talk about the history of Missouri. And then you're like, well, I don't live in Missouri. So what's... I don't know anything about Missouri. <laughs> it's like, what? Right, so that's the number two. And then you have to talk about the Renaissance. And then you think it's a fruit. So that's number two. And you think that's bad. What about number three? Every presentation, Marsha, I can't believe we put 12, 14, 16 year old kids through this. It's tied to a punishment. Like mm -hmm. if you don't do a great job, you lose 25% of your grade. It's never, hey, Brendan's going to give this presentation. If he doesn't do a good job, we're still going to clap for him. No, if you suck, you lose 25% of your mark. So we grew up believing that communication is a chore and nobody wants to get better at doing the dishes. And they don't want to get better at doing the dishes and the dishes are something that we do literally every day. And communication is something we do every day. So it is valuable to be able to improve these tools, which is what we're going to keep diving into. I also think of like, I remember going to my parents, I was probably maybe 11, 10 or 11. And I said, I wanted to compete in a public speaking competition in our school. Really? And so here's, here's another interesting, I just want to share it. Cause I'm sure this is a piece of it. My parents were like, you can't, that's too scary. And I'm like, why is it scary? I don't know why it's scary. And they're like, it's too scary. Like you can't get up there and do. And so I, I didn't like to follow a lot of the rules. And I was like, but I, love I, that. I, I want to, and I didn't know why I wanted to, and ended up winning that regionals and moving on. And it, like, it's, it's really funny, but if I, we also do subscribe to what other people say. And if that's your parents who are thinking they're trying to protect you, I often attribute like being able to speak starting in that, like at that 10 year old wanting to just stand up and share a story. That's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. And Marsha and what's, what's great about that as well. It teaches us a couple of things. One the reason why you grew up loving communicate, and by the way, you're great at it, is because your frame of reference is different than most kids mm -hmm. in that age group, mm -hmm. right? So most of us, it's presentations, whereas you, it's like, I want to win this competition. Mm -hmm. I want to do well at this. Yeah. Right? So because your frame of reference, and I actually attribute the same lesson to theater kids. Yes. Theater kids grew up being great communicators as well. Not necessarily because they're better than us. It's because their frame of reference is different. And obviously, all of them can't be introverts. There has to be some introverts in theater. And those people still grow up being confident. Why? Because their frame of reference is different. And then the second thing that it teaches us, you know, this, the incredible story that you shared, is we need to learn the right things from the right people. Mm -hmm. Our parents can teach us a lot about life, but they're flawed like we are. And that took me a long time to realize too, only probably when I was in my early 20s, that wait a second, there's a lot of incredible things that my parents have taught me, but there's also things that I should avoid because if I want to be a top 1% performer in other in any industry, really, whether it's communication, health, relationships, wealth, that automatically implies, and most of us don't realize this, that we cannot listen to the advice of 99% of people because they don't have what we want. 
No. And that is like, that is such a true point because how many times do we find ourselves going to someone for validation information and they're not creating or doing what we're aspiring to do? But it's 1000%. Our, yeah. It's our go-to people. I think that is like, that is, that's a, such a great point. I just want to say it again, like need to learn the right things from the right people. So always make sure I used to, um, when I first started in business, really work to learn from people who had created what I wanted, but now I actually aspire and I do check in regularly. I align with people who are creating what I want to create and living the life that I aspire to live. So that, I don't know why I missed that part to be totally honest in the beginning. I didn't. And now it's like, no way they can have all of these things, but I so admire like the values and and the people that I choose to learn from. That's beautiful. It, it's this whole idea of time versus money in some ways. You know, I grew up when I was much younger. I, I need to be a billionaire. I need to focus on making as much money as possible. And and I had great justification for it. We didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, like, I'm not here to change the world. Let, let's get a great job and, and do well. But then when I started doing that, to your point, Marsha, I started asking myself a more important question which is how do I want to invest my most precious resource, which is not my money, yep. but rather my time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I realized I was already a billionaire, but not of money, of time, because it doesn't matter how much you have in the bank or it doesn't matter how successful our businesses are. We can never go back to right now. Mm -mm. We can't give up all of it to go back to right now. And when I realized that, I started asking myself bigger questions of life, which is how do we spend the rest of our time? Going back to what you said around lifestyle, which is just as important as any other area of life, is how are they actually spending their life and what are they doing? Yeah, I'm definitely receiving that. And I hope that's landing for everyone because I, I couldn't agree more. <clears throat> that is so important. So how do you master your time then? Right. So, so not easy. I'm still a work in progress mm -hmm. as most of us are, but I would say the biggest question that helped me, I know it centers around money, but I feel it helps people because a lot of people struggle with that part of their life. And the question is rather, if I made you an instant billionaire, what would you do with the rest of your life and your time? Not the money. Mm -hmm. And the reason this shocks people, Marsha, is because all of us are subconsciously optimizing for a number that we didn't put in our minds, which is 65. Retiring for 65, making it to 65. But this question shatters that belief. And the reason it does is because Steve Jobs died in his 50s. Kobe Bryant died when he was 42. Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, died before he was 65. So when you start thinking about these bigger questions, it changes the way that you aggressively optimize your time. Going back to the decision I made, why did I quit my six-figure corporate job that I literally spent my whole life trying to get? Like if you had told me at 19 that I was going to get the job, which I already thought was impossible and quit it, I was, I thought, okay, there's something wrong with you. There's some sort of mental illness this person might have. They're talking to me, but that's what I ended up doing. Yeah. And the reason it was challenging is not because of the money. It's because it required a changing of my identity of who I was and how I was being in the world. So when I got to that point, making the decision to, to quit and to, literally cut out probably 70, 75% of my income to make master talk full time was the decision I made consciously because I realized in that moment of my life, how much time was more valuable than money. So I said, you know what? I love my job. Uh, most people don't like their nine to five. I really enjoyed it, but I needed to quit it because every hour I was spending in a meeting, helping some technology implementation, I could be on a podcast with you sharing my message with the world. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized I can't get this hour back. So I might as well spend it doing this than being uh, at work doing creating systems or stuff for other people. <laughs> I love that answer. And I think it's just, it shows that it's, it's a daily time audit. Like you're daily choosing, where am I spending this time? And is, I always ask myself, like, is this going to move me closer to or further away from where I want to go? It doesn't mean that I don't get to have downtime. It's just that what's going to move me closer to where I want to go. Absolutely. And what that looks like as well is my three C's, coaching conversations and content creation. So I'll repeat that again, mm -hmm. coaching conversations and content creation. That's all I want to spend most of my life doing. And, it, and a lot of the work that I used to do didn't fall under those three C's. So I had to change my life. Which you did, which you did. And you changed your identity. So this is where I want to, I want to get into this piece because I'm, I'm like deep into my NLP masters and it, it's so fascinating but it really is. It's like, if you don't change at the identity level, 
there's no habit that you can add to it. There's no ritual. There's no routines. There's no, you can read all the books that you want, but if you don't change at the identity level, it, it doesn't change. So when you hit that point, was it a very easy decision to step into your own business? Like, and you just went, okay, this is where I'm going. Or did you struggle with it for a little while? Definitely the second. I struggle with it a ton. You know, I never thought I was a business owner. I'm the first person to graduate from university in my lineage of families. And the reason I say that is because my identity was very much wrapped around having a university level job, career, yeah. especially especially at a company like IBM, because in my culture, people actually know what that company means. Mm-hmm. They go like, cause that's the only job my mom understood. Like every Like the job that I do now, my mom has no idea what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but IBM, I know what that is. <laughs> yes, I know what that is. So yes, it was stressful, not just for me, but for a family, because I was the only breadwinner until very, very recently mm-hmm. when I quit. So I was really stressed to quit my job. And so I'm very empathetic to that. Mm-hmm. So here, here's what I would say. I definitely struggled with that. I had a coach, my business partner kind of just said, I'll just pay you whatever IBM paid you to quit your job. So he gave me a lot of confidence there and I got lucky there. Mm-hmm. But I'd say the biggest part, is starting with the end first, as Stephen Covey says, and really going through these questions. Here, here's another way of thinking about this. Let me spin it in my direction, Marsha. Tony Robbins says the best. He says the quality of your life is solely determined by the quality of the question that you ask yourself. Let me push it more aggressively with my version of Tony's quote, which is, if you ask one hard question about life every single day for 30 days, you'll never be the same ever again. So if you wake up every day, And you ask yourself one difficult question about your life. Example, I call them 80-20 questions. What are the 20% of the questions that lead to 80% of one's clarity in life? Mm -hmm. So one of those questions is, if I give you all the money in the world, how would you spend your time? Most people answer travel. And I immediately respond with, okay, what are you going to do? Travel for seven years and then die? And then another question is, okay, so you you figure that time piece out. If you were 99 years old today on your deathbed and you had an opportunity to come back to right now, what would you do right now and why? Or questions like, if you could only accomplish three things in your life and only three, what would you want those three things to be and why? And I'm just the product of someone who has answered thousands and thousands and thousands of questions. And that's why I always like to say that I have the wisdom of someone who's already dead. Because you you've like literally put yourself through those questions and created that change. And with those questions, for example, you're expanding what you subconsciously see as available and as possibility, which can change your identity. Yeah, absolutely. So as a person who stepped into growing your business, what did it look like in the beginning compared to now? Because I realize it's only a year and a half, but I also know as an entrepreneur, like what I did last year is so different than this year. So I know it can change. So what did that look like? Absolutely. So so let's start at the beginning, which is there wasn't a business. Mm-hmm. You know, I was on my mother's couch. I had three months before I started working at IBM. This was January 2019. And I said, you know, all this information I taught people, because at this point I was 22, I had coached 70 people on how to speak, which is insane mm-hmm. because all of it was an accident. And somebody just gave me the idea to start a YouTube channel. So I said, okay, let's just make videos. So there was no business. So let's start there. Point zero, I was enjoying my lobster dinners at IBM. They treated me really well. They pampered me really well. I wasn't thinking about quitting that job. Definitely not. Lobster dinners, sorry, keep going. Yeah, yeah, lobster dinner. And let me push this even more. It's funny. I don't think I've shown this on a podcast. Is I, I go into a breakfast at a hotel and the guy comes up to me and he goes, welcome, sir. And I'm like, dude, I'm like 22. He's like, what? <laughs> Because I've never been in a $200 hotel. Like, that's how like, little yeah. I had in life. So I was like, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't looking to start a business. So, But what happened, Marsha, was nine months into Master Talk, probably around September of 2019, I was still making videos every week. Because it was a nice hobby, a nice side project for me. And then I went to Columbus, Ohio for an event called Summit of Greatness by a guy named Lewis I Howes. know. I got to meet him once. Oh, He's that's awesome. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, Lewis is awesome. I go every year to, mm-hmm. to his event. He's great. So I went there and it changed my life because I met my business partner there. So I went to a 5 a.m. workout. That's how his events go, mm-hmm. which are insane. And there was an, a workout called the Deck of Pain. So I'm there and I'm sweating. It's crazy. And the guy next to me is 20 years older than me. And he just asked me a simple question. He said, what do you do? And I said, oh, you know, I make YouTube videos. And he started laughing. He's like, okay, great kid. What do you make YouTube videos on? Mm-hmm. And I said, public speaking communication. And then he looked at me and he said, what? 
And then he started watching my videos and messaged me after the conference and said, do you do coaching? Do you charge people? And I said, no, nah, I just, uh, I have a great job at IBM. Mm -hmm. He's like, you do realize you can charge executives thousands of dollars for coaching. And I laughed at him and he said, I'll be your first client. And he wrote me my first check. That's when I realized I had something. Oh, okay. So that obviously that you were available for that opportunity. You put yourself in the room so that you were like in that because people, so many people will be sitting and waiting for the break to happen, but you know, you have to initiate and you going to the conference, being in this space and speaking allows this opportunity to happen. So client comes in. Now you're working with a client. You're still building videos and all, did it take long for you to see now, like what was possible with building your business? I mean, let's start with the first piece that you touched upon and nailed, Marsha, which is you need to be available for those opportunities. You know, the president of Microsoft, I forgot his name. He said this in a, in a book called The Third Door by Alex Benayan. Oh, I love that book. Yeah. Yeah. You're awesome, by the way, Marsha. I can clearly see we have a lot in common. <laughs> this is great. So, so he says... And and to be transparent, I didn't read the book. I listened to a podcast. I'm not good with reading books. He said, uh, he said, luck is like a bus. So the bus will always keep coming to the bus stop. But if you don't have the change in your pocket to get on the bus, the bus will just leave and you can't get on. So if you prepare for those opportunities in life, the bus will come. So yeah, did I think I was going to start a business and be a gajillionaire? No, no, not at all. But did I feel I wanted to help people and, and make things and have that desire outside of work to do something important, which is a principle that I'll teach a little bit later on the show? Absolutely. So I started making these videos. I was putting it out in the world. I wasn't waiting for permission. But then when somebody presented an opportunity, and I feel that's one of my superpowers, is the willingness to always change my mind when needed if a better opportunity objectively shows itself. To always question the decision, but also to keep balancing that with moving forward and moving the ball forward. Mm -hmm. So when he wrote me that first check, I said, okay, this person should probably be my coach. And then I messaged him and I said, okay, what events are you going to this year? And he made a list of all of them and I bought his hotels and I said, hey, can I just stay with you? And mm -hmm. I took that initiative and I went to Los Angeles and San Diego and I met him one-on-one. -on -one and I said, I need to build a relationship with this guy because he clearly gives a shit about me. Yep. And that's how everything expanded. But let me go back to the principle to make this tangible for the audience, which is simply this. And I'm more of a tough love guy. So let's just get into the tough love. Are you making your purpose your priority? You know, a lot of people say they have passions, they, they have a dream and they don't do it, but they don't make it their priority. And let me make a laundry list about how I made my purpose my priority, quote, long before I had the idea for Master Talk. Long before. So when I was 21 and I didn't have the idea for Master I started when I was 22. I'm 26 now currently. I didn't really know what my passion was, what my dream was, but I did know I wanted to serve the world. So I made it my priority. When I started working at IBM, I saved 80% of my income. I still live with my mother. Even to this day, I still do. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't need to anymore, I do very well in the business now. But when I started, it definitely wasn't the case. So I was just saving all of my pennies just in case someday, if I had something, I would be able to pursue it. I don't own a dog because it's too expensive. Like I do all of these decisions to optimize my cash flow so that when I'm ready, I was going to do it. And even if I never found my purpose, my objective in life was to just donate a lot of money to charity. Well, shit, if I can't, if I don't have a, something to create impact for, at least I'm going to donate to Scott Harrison's charity water and help him solve the water crisis. That was literally my mentality. Mm -hmm. It's just master talk landed, landed in my lap because I made conscious decisions in my life to keep getting smarter, to keep making decisions, to keep asking questions about life. And eventually I had enough clarity that the universe just said, okay, you're ready for master talk now. And it fell in my lap. Oh, okay. So before I even dive into master talk, I just want everybody to listen to that segment again, because that is, that is so, so critical is that you kept doing, like kept showing up, kept doing the pieces and really staying firm in that belief that it's like, it's coming, it's going to figure itself out. And I'm going to be ready when it comes. Right. Cause how many times the opportunity actually comes, but we're standing still thinking it's going to come on like a gold plate completely laid out with the rules and the steps and everything. And it just doesn't, it, that's not how it works. I think it's actually really funny. I heard it recently on a podcast where as entrepreneurs, you want to get out of the nine to five job. You want you, you're done with somebody telling you how to do it. And then you go on your own and you're mad because nobody's telling you how to do it. <laughs> you, 
and you, so you, you stop doing what you need to do because you're waiting for someone to tell you, but that's what you just left. So how can you actually like go internal and follow, follow, check in every day, ask different questions. I love those steps. Oh yeah. And, and let's double click on that. Cause I'm glad, I'm glad you paused there. So there's very specific advice that I have here. Cause I think pursuing passions is actually a really stupid idea mm -hmm. because passions are very general. You can be passionate about anything, your dog, your, the lifeguard outside, like it doesn't matter. You can be yep. passionate about everything. Yep. Whereas for me, the decision has always been decisions over passions. I never asked myself what I was passionate about life. I always asked myself a very different question. What does the world need me most to do right now and why? And when I was 12, the answer to that question, Marsha, was not starting a YouTube channel. I thought that was for rich white kids who didn't have anything better to do with their life, mm -hmm. to be quite frank. For me, it was save my mother. She's working at 50 hours a week at this shitty job. Let me retire her. I don't even care if I'm miserable in my $100,000 job. That's the priority. But here's the punch, Marsha. Mm -hmm. If I never made the decision to go to business school, I never would have became an accountant. If I never became an accountant or had a desire to do that, I never would have done case competitions because that was the main reason I did them. And if I never did case competitions, I never would have gotten a job at IBM. And if I'd never done all of that, I never would have coached any of those people and this conversation wouldn't exist. Yeah. Isn't right. it funny when you sit right. there sometimes and you look at it and it's like, oh, all of those things made sense actually. Now that I look at them, they all make sense. Correct. So this and takes you, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. no, no, no worries. It's it just because it, you double tap. So so what's the what's the decision? The number one thing to greatness, I think there's three steps to greatness. Mm -hmm. The first step to greatness is you need to make the decision to find the gift, not do the gift, not cultivate the gift, but you need to make a conscious decision in your mind. That's step zero to actually say, I have a gift and I'll find it someday. That's the most important step that 99% of people listening to this don't make. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. And every decision needs to be aligned with that. That means listen to the right podcasts, invest in the coaching, go to the personal development conferences, surround yourself with those people so that eventually you find the gift. Number two is one day when you find it, cultivate the hell out of it. For some people, they get lucky in some ways. I did. I found it very early in life. For other people like Sarah Blakely, it takes eight years selling fax machines and you have the idea for Spanx and you're on your way. So for all of us, it's different. But when you find the gift, cultivate it. And then the third step to greatness, which is the the one that I'm entering right now in my season of life, which is kind of weird for me to say, is create space for other people to find their gift. Mm. Create space for other people to find their greatness. So now that I found mine, I spent a lot of my time outside of my communication thought leadership, which I think it will be my legacy. I also spend as much time thinking about how can I help other people optimize their gift. And I feel some of these nuggets hopefully helped in helping other people optimize theirs. Yeah. Oh, that is... That was such a powerful um, statement. And I want to know how, how is it that you create space for other people to find their greatness? Beautiful question. I love that question. I would love to get your perspective on this too, Marsha. Yeah, okay, I'm ready. Absolutely. But I would say for me, because it's challenging, for you to create space for other people, actually, let me take back a statement I said earlier. I said the word challenging. It actually isn't that challenging. Let me make this. It's actually really easy. So mm -hmm. I don't know why I said that. Here, let me give you the, the the tactic. Make a list of the five people you love the most in your life. Growth friends. They don't have to be successful people, just people who want to be successful in any way. And do something that you've never done with them, which is sit them down for a 45-minute conversation and go through their three top goals for the year and why it matters to them. I am shocked at how, how few people do this with each other. And it doesn't need to be perfect. You don't need to spend $15,000 on a coach to do this. It's literally make a list of five people you care about, sit them all down and spend an hour just going through each other's goals and why it matters to them. And I do this all the time with the people in my network mm -hmm. or on many other levels because I've, I've, I've less time these days. So podcasts are more effective for me. But when yep. you get started, that's the recommendation. So what you're doing is you're creating space for other people, but you don't need to be like an NLP practitioner. You don't need to be like a superhuman, right? Just start that practice with the, with that the network around you and ask people what their goals are and why it matters to them and just listen. And doing that alone is a very simple way to create space. But obviously there's more advanced levels we can talk about after, but I'd say that's the easiest thing that everyone could take action on right now.
Yeah, that's such a great thing. Like, I think that it's also helps on both ends, right? As a listener and learning and as a person going through, if you were going through this with exercise with somebody and you were doing it and you were actually facilitating someone else, you were learning so much more about yourself and them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's what I did, by the way. Like, and people did that with me when I was starting. Like, master, just so people understand this, mass talk, the word was not invented by me. My friend invented it. The guy who does my video productions is my best friend who charges me a heavy discount. And the guy who made my logo made it just because he wanted to. Because I was just telling people, hey, I got some idea for the stupid channel, which is what I was calling it. And he said, and he was telling me in French, brother, you need like a YouTube logo. And I was like, what so the reason i say that's because i don't just say that that's how i applied it so when and because i didn't have money for coaching all that stuff when i was getting started so i just go up to people and tell them my goals hey this is what i'm thinking what do you think and they would say a b c do this mm -hmm. and that's how I, I i got to where i am today it, it, this is another piece i just want to i feel like i keep piggybacking off of what you're saying but i want to share please this. Is that I think that people also go, but I don't know anybody who can help. And I'm like, are you willing to say your goals out loud? Because I actually think that like, and I've been doing this recently in the last month or two months and in what I want to create, what I am creating, what I'm in the process of doing, because I always believe the universe is like the people will show up. And I think that if I can speak life into those goals, then all of a sudden now, if you see this person over here, you're like, oh, well, that's actually their specialty. That's what they do. And so maybe if people would be more willing to communicate, not to play on that word and speak what their goals and visions and purpose is, then that might open up the doors for other people to help them with it. Uh, absolutely, Marsha. And I love that you're piggyback. This is exactly, this is perfect. So so you're actually the good cop. Let me be the bad cop here for okay. people listening. So for me, it's, look, if for everyone listening who's saying, I don't have anybody, if you're going to any vacation, any vacation, yeah. Cuba, Dominican, some, some other, then you definitely have the money. In the sense of when I went to Summit of Greatness, that story I was telling earlier, people don't know this, but I went alone. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't really have people who are trying to like make a big difference in the world. And I was probably nine months at the master. That was a stupid idea. But I said, you know what? I always wanted to go to this conference. And it wasn't expensive. No. It was a no, it's it was a, Yeah, it's like a three hundred dollar ticket. Let me spill it out for people listening, because I'm bad cop today. Three hundred dollars. I I was in a thirty dollar a day Airbnb mm -hmm. with some other lady in Columbus. <laughs> right. And I was taking like a $10 Uber back and forth to the conference. So my spend and my flow is probably like 300 bucks too. So my spend to be there wasn't $70 million. Mm -hmm. It was like $500. And that $500 put me in the right place because who in the hell is going to go to Columbus? Exactly. The people who actually want to make a difference in the world. And I went to every one of those people. I told them my dreams and they all said, I need this, but I can't afford a coach. I need this, but I can't afford. And that's when I said, I got this. And I made net friends with all those people. And I said, you're my new tribe. And I made it work. What's the principle? The principle is this. There are two types of people in the world. Probably one of the best insights I've gotten in my life from a guy named Beryl Solomon. He says, there's people who make an excuse to do the thing. Or people who make an excuse to not do the thing. Just two types of people. The first type of person is going to say, oh, you know, Marsha, I got 30 minutes. Maybe I got time to listen to this podcast, let's say. And the other person goes, you know, I only have seven minutes, but let me do a quick exercise for five so I can actually can do something. And you got to make a decision on who you want to be in this life. And you get to choose every day. Like this is like literally the, this is the whole premise of this show is like own your choices on your life. When you own every single choice that you every all day long, we get to choose. And I know that that can be a hard pill for people to swallow, including myself. Some days is we get to choose how we spend our time, what we do with it. And does that action move me closer to or further away from where I want to go? That's my like compass always coming back to. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Master talks. So how did you get to this space of like actually going, okay, it's going to be on YouTube. This is what it's going to look like. And because you've got a great following on YouTube and honestly, great videos. I was watching some this morning. I, yeah, I do my little homework. So it's, all good. Good. it's all good. How did you get, how did it come to that? And what did it look like in the beginning compared to now? 
Absolutely, Marsha. So so let's start with the the first point, which is, you know, one of the questions I, I went over a bit quickly earlier around if you could only accomplish three things in your life, what would you want those three things to be? And this is a question I always think about. So I'd say the first part is we can't be world class at everything. We need to really focus on being who you want to be. So when I looked at my life, which is literally step one, I want to start a YouTube channel. What should I start it on? I made a list of the different topics that I thought I would be good at. So one of them was career coaching. Another one was kind of like life coaching. I was helping people with their direction in life. Another one is public speaking coach. I had this long list. And then what I did is I wrote a number next to each of those topics, Marcia. And the number corresponded to the following question. On a scale of one to 10, mm -hmm. how energetically excited would I be to do this one thing for the next 10 years of my life? On a scale of one to 10, how energetically would, would I be or energetically excited would I be rather to do this one thing for the next 10 years? That's the first question I asked myself. The second question I asked myself is if I'm being honest, using comparison as a tool, because I believe comparison is not the thief of joy, which is controversial. I think comparison is a tool if you know how to leverage it effectively. Mm -hmm. So if you think if you think a screwdriver is going to save your life and you use it in the wrong way and you compare the wrong things like the money, the cars, you're not going to do it correctly. But if you use comparison the right way, okay, if I want to be a YouTuber in this niche, who are the people who have been successful with that already? And what have they done? And am I willing to, to pay the price to get to that level? Mm -hmm. So I was very thoughtful about the way that I chose the topic and the strategy around my channel. So let me skip over a couple of parts. Let's get to the juice here. I realized very quickly that, look, I could be a top 10% career coach. I could be a top 10% life coach and do very well. But I honestly believe I could be the best in the world at communication coaching. There's so many gaps that everyone else didn't have. And I felt I could be the next Dale Carney because even Dale covers a lot of stuff that I think about that he doesn't cover in his books. Like, how would your life change if you're an exceptional communicator? Like, So all of those gaps. So basically what I did is I studied all these YouTube channels and I realized a few things. One is if I posted once a week for 10 years, I would win because of how young I am. B, if the quality of that information is better than everyone else's, so create questions and thoughts that people aren't thinking about on the channel. And the last piece was if I put all my energy into just being strong at comms and communication, not defocusing, not derailing my focus, putting all my attention on that. So everything I did made me successful. Last thing I'll say on this point that I think made me win in YouTube is I was willing, and I said this at the beginning of when I started my channel, I'm willing to go on 10,000 podcasts to make Master Talk successful. Mm -hmm. Even if Marsha is the only person listening to me, which isn't the case, obviously. Not. But even if that was the case, I am willing to do 10,000 because even if the algorithm thinks I suck, at least I would have 10,000 subscribers. And that mentality made me successful a lot quicker, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> 10, but it's it's so good everything that you're saying is so good because it's like you have to be willing like how much can you put yourself out there to keep going and when you're talking about like what would you love to do for like would it energetically excite you for the next 10 years to do this not everybody will agree with that. And that's why it's so important that you know what is important to you, what your gifts are, what you want to do, right? Like this is, I can't stress this enough because I can't tell you how many mentors have said to me, you put too much time into podcasting. You should not be doing this much podcasting. You don't get paid to podcast. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to keep following my gut. I'm going to keep following my gut. This is going, I know it's like you can see the vision. So you have to be willing to do that. Yes, you're going to have some cheerleaders, but you're going to have some people who are going to go like, man, what are you doing? I love that you added that nuance, Marsha, because it's so important. The lesson that people should draw from this conversation is not, I should sacrifice my life and be a YouTuber and communication. The lesson should be, how self-aware are you? about your strengths, but more importantly, which is my definition of self-awareness, is having an equal understanding of what your strengths and your weaknesses are. Because for some people who are listening to this podcast, for them, their 10 out of 10 life is make $100,000 a year working 30 hours a week, 
spending the weekends with their family, a- a- having kids, doing all these great things that they can be doing with their life, but making a conscious decision to do all of those things. Whereas for me, it was very consciously sacrifice everything for the next 10 years, most of it, so that I could be the greatest of all time in this spe- space because I think the next Elon Musk is a seven-year-old girl who can't afford me and nobody's trying to help that little girl mm-hmm. on how to speak. And that's my mission. So I'm willing to sacrifice everything. Like for me, balance is... Do 20 shows a week, coach shit ton of clients, but take five weeks off at some point mm. where, and I, well, two at a time where I just spend time with family, but the outside of those two weeks, I'm just focused on what I'm doing. But I feel that's the crux is most people aren't asking themselves the important questions to then align the uniqueness of who they are with how they're unique life is supposed to lead because they're all different at the end of the day so there's no way for you to lead a happy life you can exactly mirror and copy other people it just can't work just from a mathematical perspective so what does that lead us it leads us to the following if you want to lead a fulfilling life you need to realize that the only way to do that is to make every decision that is entirely unique to who you are and how you're being because if you don't do that you won't achieve it Mm. I, I really, I know this is going to land with somebody because I know that this is hitting such a core and it, the beautiful thing about communication is it, it impacts everybody. Like this is something that impacts everyone. And there's something that I want to ask and see if I can ask it in this way is why is it so important? I know you've said it, but I want to just kind of tie in a, a different way. Why is it so important for anybody who's listening to improve their communication skills to be able to speak, to be able to share. Absolutely, Marcia. For everyone, I would say it affects every moment of your life. Mm-hmm. It's not just about getting a job promotion or getting a raise or working a job or working in your business. It's the way you talk to your family. It's the way that you order food at a restaurant. It's the way that you make new friends when you travel. And when we realize that communication is about leading a more fulfilling life, it's every moment, it's every conversation, it's every interaction, then we realize very quickly that communication helps us lead a more fulfilling life. And that's why I always say, Marsha, that communication is an accelerant of dreams. What do you want? Who has already achieved what you've achieved in your life? Whether you want to be an amazing mother to three kids, whether you want to be a a super uh, bodybuilder with a six pack and winning Olympian competitions, whatever, figure out what you want, who has what you want, but ask yourself the most important question. Well, actually, a question is equally as important, which is how is that person communicating? Mm -hmm. That person who already has what you want, how is that person speaking out in the world? And are you speaking like them? Are you sharing their ideas? And that doesn't mean speaking on a stage necessarily. That means if you want to be that world-class mother who has an incredible relationship with their children, are you able to communicate healthy boundaries and teach your kids that right now or not? Mm-hmm. What what type of boundaries are you setting? Are you going up to your significant other and saying, I want more alone time? Or are you actually being more mature about it and saying, hey, babe, I need 90 minutes every morning to read because this 90 minutes helps me go about my day with strong peace of mind and allows me to show up better for our family. Notice how that is communication too, right? Yeah, it's so different because you are, uh, these words come up so often on the show, um, but it's the piece of learning to respond to what's happening as opposed to reacting, right? So when you're responding, I feel like you're actually communicating in a way that can support you supports potentially the relationship. But when we're constantly reacting to everything, that's not communication. That's like yelling and fighting. That's not, that doesn't serve anybody. Right. And it definitely didn't serve me with my relationship with my mom 10 years ago. So you have to learn. You, right? do and have grow. To learn. you do have to learn. I also can see this spin even more. And I just want to nail one more piece to it is for people who are like, we, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but the number of people who have jumped into online business, coaching, supporting, podcasting, writing all of the pieces over the last two years of the pandemic just to elevate a little bit more how important communication skills are for them because the piece is is that whether you have a product or you're a service or you are a writer like people buy from people we want to know who you are and so I keep saying all the time like you have to learn how to speak 
and who, know who you are and share that because that's what we want to buy from is somebody that we know, somebody we can connect to, somebody we can relate to. So I just want to know if there's any other pieces there you want to add or share when it comes to a person in business to be able to communicate who they are. Absolutely, Marcia. So a couple of things that I'll say on that. The first thing I'll say for business owners specifically is a question a lot of them don't think about, which is the following. As your business scales, are your communication skills scaling with the business? Mm. And the reason I say this is, let me give a couple of examples here. So let's say you're a business owner doing early six figures. Let's say seventy-five dollars to $100,000 a year. You're usually doing all parts of the delivery yourself, which means you're the one selling, you're the one marketing, you're the one delivering and ascending if you have a coaching or service-based business. So ascending, for those who are listening, just means you're sending them, you're upselling them into other products so they can be customers for life, not just for today. But when you mature as a business owner, you start making three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars a year, and you start increasing your bandwidth, you start to hire people. You start to delegate, maybe not a million people, you know, two or three individuals, four or five, depending on what the business is. And you need to start delegating. But the problem is, is if you don't have the communication skills of a guy or a gal who's doing seven figures a year, example, creating standard operating procedures, knowing how to delegate effectively, what you're doing is you're creating inefficiencies within your business. Because a lot of your employees are going to come to you and say, "Uh, what did you say? What did you mean? And they will never live up to your expectation because you don't know how to set the expectation to begin with. Mm -hmm. So that's a big problem. So essentially what the principle ends up being, Marsha, is assume your business is going to be successful. Don't assume, because you don't assume it's not going to be successful, right? right? So assume the end state of the business, kind of like what Mike Mike Tyson says, believe you're the champion before you actually are the champion, is go to the end state of the business first and ask yourself, who already has that level, whatever the number is, and uh, no judgment on what the number is, and ask yourself, what type of communicator is that person? And then be honest about the delta between the person you admire in your field of work and who you are today, and close that gap as quickly as possible. Reason being, and this is the good news, most people don't think in that dimension. That's why I have a business. (laughs) And then when you think of it that when you close that delta, you can quickly accelerate your dreams and you'll always already be ready for the next level of growth before you get there. Yeah. What a fantastic answer. And when I look at like for, if I, I'm going to say this then to tie it to what you're saying, if you are listening to this and you want to learn to improve your communication skills, whether it's in life and our business, because it it's important everywhere in looking at the different topics and things you are covering on your YouTube channel, you're like, you're able to help close the gap for people because you are definitely, there's all different kinds of things that you are sharing and teaching in your YouTube channel. So if you look at it right now, what are you most proud of with your YouTube channel that you have created and anything else you want to share on that? I would say the thing that I'm most proud of, Marsha, for sure, is definitely retiring my mom. That's my proudest accomplishment by far. In terms of the the YouTube channel, though, I would say the biggest thing is really impact. You know, I I think it really frustrated me in the world, Marsha. I think that's what pushed me. Everyone's motivated by different things. Mm -hmm. Some of us are motivated by purpose. I would say the biggest motivator for me is really competition. Mm -hmm. That's always been the biggest thing. And then it transcended into purpose later in life. And for me, it was really that, I don't mind people who do well financially in our space because a lot of people do really well if you're a great communication coach. But I think what frustrated me is if you do well, you should help people who can't afford you. And that's just a belief that I have in the world. So even if my business is a lot better than two years ago, thankfully for me, it's it's more about a conversation of the next Elon Musk is a seven-year-old girl in Cambodia and she doesn't have access to these free tools. Because if somebody taught Elon Musk when he was 15 years old in South Africa when he was a kid how to communicate, he would have still been successful, but he would have had a much easier time getting to across the goalpost. And I feel that's really what my mission, what my legacy is. And Mass Chalk and the YouTube, the YouTube channel creates a medium, a pull for people to gravitate towards it and give people access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I just absolutely love that because I think that we can do it all. We can have success. We can create financial success. And we can pay it forward and do incredible things with it. Like I just, I, it's, that's non-negotiable to me because I don't even, anyways, no, I don't judge that. It's just very important to me that we pay it forward 
because I think we've all had times when we were in that space, whether it's the seven-year-old, the 10-year-old, where it's like, I just, I wish I knew like something to learn to how to grow this, what to do to see what's possible. Not that I can't afford any support available. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And and that's what I'm so passionate about. Cause when I was 20 years old, I didn't have money for support. It was really about, you know, people who, who created free podcasts like you and Lewis, all these people that really changed my life and, and definitely paying it forward is the only way. Beautiful. Oh, where can people, speaking of that, the best place for people to connect with you and follow you? Absolutely. Rush. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It was such a great conversation. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. So let's say, of course. So two ways to keep in touch. The first one is definitely the YouTube channel. Just go to Master Talk in one word and you'll have access to hundreds of free videos on how to speak. And number two is a free training I do over Zoom every three weeks that's live and interactive. So I facilitate that call. It's super fun. It's not some boring webinar. So if you want to come to that, go to rockstarcommunicator.com. Oh, I love that you give that back. That's fantastic. Like That is fantastic. I actually heard um, Alex Benayan. And I mean, for anybody who is wondering, I, that is literally one of my favorite books is the, third oh, really? book. yeah, I've listened to it on audible and I think I've listened to it twice and it's really, it's, a, it's a really, it's a great book because he talks about how like the first door is, is there, right? Sometimes we have to push to get to the second door, but very few people actually look for the third door and it's, it's there, it's available. It's just that we stop looking. So anyways, I heard him not that long ago, and I think he spent his whole first year online during um, the first 2020 to 2021, and he was doing weekly Zooms to coach and support people. And the interviewer was like, well, what did you charge for that? He goes, I didn't charge. He goes, why, why would you give all that for free? And he goes, because it felt like the right thing to do. There was a lot of people who are capitalizing on so much at that time, but I wanted to give back in a different way. And he goes, you know what? All I can say is the universe paid me back tenfold. It's it all works itself out. Oh yeah. And yeah, and I I I just like that that mentality. This has been an incredible conversation. I have like so many other things I could ask you, but I know we'll stay connected. And I want to ask you one more quick question. And it is what lesson in life are you most grateful for? What lesson in life am I the, the most grateful for? It's a quote. And the quote is be insane or be the same. If you want to be like everyone else, that's totally fine. But if you made it 55 minutes in this podcast, you probably don't want to be like everyone else. Probably not. Right. You probably want to do something important with your life. I wish you would have clicked off a long time ago. Yeah. So so the advice is this. We need to realize, Marsha, that the people who do crazy things with their life, incredible things, are often crazy people. Don't you find it odd, Marsha, that as a 22-year-old kid, I started a YouTube channel, not on skits, not on comedy, not on music, but on executive communication. To, and then I went on to coach those people who are like two decades older than me, yet I still live in my mother's basement. I go clubbing every quarter. I can karaoke in eight different languages. I have a car, but I'm too scared to drive it. And you would think, actually, this is my proudest accomplishment. You asked me earlier. It's actually this. Spotify messaged me once, and they said I was in the 0.5%, not the 5%, the 0.5% of taught listeners of Justin Bieber in the world. And I was super proud of that. So what's the point? The point is this team. If you want to be like everyone else, go do that. But if you want to do something really special in your life, you need to realize the following, that if you make decisions that are entirely unique to you and how you're being, that's how you'll actually create a life worth living. So be insane or be the same is my final parting words. Oh my God. Fantastic quote. Honestly, I absolutely loved it. And I love this conversation. Thank you so much for being here, Brennan, honestly, and for the value you gave to everyone. Likewise, Marsha. I love the value you gave too. Lots of great, lots of great piggybacks, <laughs> whatever we call it. <laughs>